Well, good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Benita Dodd, and I am Vice President of the Foundation. And um, I've been with the Foundation going on 19 years now. And I will tell you quite frankly that while I love energy policy, my passion is with the Foundation's energy po uh, education policy. Wasn't that a great panel? Um, and, and, and the reason that I am that excited about education is that I'm from South Africa. Yes, it is a southern accent. And I, and, and I like to tell people that I had no choice, first of all, in South Africa, and I succeeded in spite of my education and not because of it. And I never want that to happen to anybody in this nation. And so it's a huge passion of mine. So yesterday was a wonderful day in Georgia. I opened up my social media and all my friends were celebrating the veterans in their lives and in their families. And it was just so exciting. Another reason to be just so happy to be in this country. And then I went to bed last night, uh, took my son's, he's, he, he's a Marine, I took his profile picture off and um, um, Went to sleep last night and got up this morning and turned on the light next to the bed and padded into the kitchen and uh, got myself a, a cup of coffee because the timer had been on and the coffee was ready. And um, I went back to pick up my phone and opened up WhatsApp to hear what's going on in South Africa from my family. and. Here's another reason I'm so grateful. They call it load shedding in South Africa. And it's a euphemism for scheduled blackouts. And going through, and they have this on a daily basis. Going through my emails, I got another email from um, the weather app. And guess what? There's a freeze warning for the metro area coming up for tomorrow and I was still grateful. Why? Because I know that the odds are that the power is coming on tomorrow. Um, if you got your Friday facts this morning, you know that one of the Friday facts was that the nation on average experienced just over eight hours of power outages in 2020. Isn't that amazing? That's like a 99.9% reliability rate for the country. These are the things that we have, we, we are so grateful for. And I tell you what, one day earlier this year, the folks in Texas woke up and it was not working for them. And as you know, everything's bigger in Texas and, as was, and so was the failure of their, um, their, their electricity grid. And so, before I even introduce our folks, I'm just going to throw out a pop quiz to them. <clears throat> Put you on the spot. What two things would you say are the biggest hurdles to energy reliability in this country? We're going to go with our guest, or we're going to go with the native here? Um, <laughs> Let's go big. Okay, I'll, I'll so say. So I need to go first. <laughs> oh, Georgia, oh, okay. uh, Georgia goes first. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just I'm, because we won the national, uh, the, the world champion, the world series. World series. I, I'm, <laughs> world list, series. I'm listening for my helpers in the alleyways, like banging trash cans, to see if they can get me the answer to this question. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not hearing anything coming through, so I'm gonna have to go on my own. I will say that I think the two biggest hurdles that we see are reliability requirements for our electric grid. The grid just allows anybody to come on board regardless of when they produce electricity. Uh, so a firming, what we call it a firming requirement, I think is a big, one of the biggest hurdles we see in having reliable electricity. And I think the second biggest hurdle, which may be even a much larger hurdle, is this uh, energy discrimination from financial institutions and banks around the world against reliable, dense energy. So I'll go with a little bit of similar on the second one at least, I think mandates government, particularly state level mandates that favor uh, non-firm resources. But the second one, uh, at least in the space where I am, is just um, accepting narratives 
with, without digging into really what's behind the narrative. There are, are too many social media headlines right now that just can't stand on their own two feet. All right. I'm was done. that two? I, that was two. Okay. It, it, All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, should I continue with this panel? Do we have winners? <laughs> <laughs> We're on All the same right. page, I think. <laughs> All right. Well, let me introduce Jason Isaac first. And Jace, Jason is um, a director of Life Powered, and it's part of our big sister think tank. That's the way I like to call them, the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Everything we do at the Georgia Public Policy Foundation, they do bigger in Texas. And we're very proud to follow in their footsteps in so many of these issues, including the Georgia Legislative Policy Forum. We went over to Texas and we saw how they did it. And admittedly, we do it on a much smaller scale, but theirs was the model. So thank you for that, Jason. So um, before Life Powered, Jason served four terms in the Texas um, State Legislature um, for Hayes and Blanco counties in, in Texas Hill Country. Now, I have been to Texas and I still have not been able to find the hills but okay. Um, so he served on the Energy Resources and Environmental Regulation Committees, among others, and as a legislator, he passed successful legislation for um, a tax reduction, election integrity, we all know about that, um, to improve public education, and to preserve Second Amendment rights, to protect local groundwater, and to protect private property rights. Um, he's appeared on national news shows, and his commentaries have been published in The Hill, The Washington Examiner, The Daily Caller, and other publications. Um, he's a graduate of Stephen F. Austin State University, and he's a high school lacrosse coach. Um, so thank you for coming, and, and, and we look forward to hearing from you. And then we have my good friend David Getty. We've been friends for a very long time, and we met for the first time today. Yeah. Um, and he is as charming as before I met him. Um, so David is an associate professor at the University of Georgia's College of Engineering and a senior fellow in the University of Georgia's Center for International Trade and Security and School of Public and International Affairs. He earned his BS and his PhD at UGA, and he comes from the private industry as well. Um, he's not just one of those ivory tower folks. No. He um, has 14 years of private industry experience as an energy services engineer and environmental engineer. And his research is in the area of, area of energy policy and integrated energy resource planning for the power sector with a focus, and this is really crucial, and we'll talk about it in a while, with a focus on the national security implications of U.S. nuclear power. Uh, he teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in energy systems and energy security. <coughs> He's on the advisory board for the Energy Policy Institute at Boise State University, and he is a member on the Advocacy Council for Nuclear Matters. If you have nuclear questions, don't hesitate to write them down. We have an expert. Mm. Um, David is currently working with his colleagues at UGA's Center for International Trade and Security to uh, stand up an applied energy studies initiative focused on the geopolitical and U.S. national security implications of, of energy and energy technologies uh, within the challenges of 21st century greater pow great power competition. He's provided testimony in the U.S. H uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee on energy issues, on climate, and on nuclear power policy. So um, I'm going to start right out with Jason. What happened? <laughs> Well, do you want to queue up the video and we'll kind That's of go into that? right. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, did, okay. The week of Valentine's Day 2021, the temperature dropped below zero. Nobody could remember it being this cold for this long. This was Texas, not Siberia. But Texas is the energy state. There was nothing to fear. Just go home, turn on the heat, and hunker down. 
That's how it should have gone. Instead, over five days, four million Texans lost power during what turned out to be the coldest winter storm in half a century. Hundreds died, including an 11-year-old boy who froze to death in his sleep. The state's electric grid operator, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, ERCOT, later reported the state was just four minutes away from total grid collapse. The media was quick to blame the state government for not being fully prepared and not acting fast enough. This may be true, but ERCOT's mistakes were symptoms, not the cause of the problem. The real cause is decades of misguided policies that have left the Lone Star State with an unreliable energy infrastructure. It's a cautionary tale that the rest of the country needs to learn from. From 2010 to 2020, the population of Texas increased by 4 million people, and the state's economy grew by 35%. But while all this growth was happening, the state's reliable energy capacity was actually shrinking. Meanwhile, its unreliable energy capacity was surging. In fact, it almost tripled. Let's break this down. Reliable energy is fossil fuels, coal and natural gas, and nuclear. These fuels produce a near constant flow of electricity. Unreliable or variable energy is renewable energy, wind and solar. They're unreliable because they depend on the whims of mother nature. In 2020, Texans got 25% of their energy from renewables. During the February storm, however, that fell to 8%, at one point reaching a deadly low of just 1.5%. The reason? Renewable energy only works when the weather cooperates, but it's useless when it doesn't. Like when it conjures up a giant snowstorm, solar panels can't capture sunlight, and wind turbines don't spin when covered in snow and ice. Given renewables' unreliability, how is it that Texas, of all places, became so dependent on them? That story begins in 1999, when Texas politicians on the left and the right fell in love with the idea that they could turn the state into a green energy powerhouse. It sounded like a great idea at the time. Instead of passing any new mandates, they would do it by offering massive subsidies marketed as incentives to produce wind and solar power. This ended up working out great for the wind and solar companies, but not so great for reliable energy providers. To illustrate this, imagine that you own a restaurant. <coughs> One day you learn that your competitor down the street is getting government support. He gets so much help that instead of charging his customers, he can pay them to eat his food. Not surprisingly, your customers abandon your restaurant for his. Your competitor prospers off the taxpayers' backs while your business withers. Let's apply this analogy to the real world of renewable energy. Wind and solar get so much in subsidies, they're guaranteed a profit. And unlike fossil fuel producers, they're not even required to provide reliable power. It's no wonder fossil fuel plants are closing and nuclear plants are not being built. Wind and solar companies are protected from the laws of supply and demand. They can't lose and the fossil fuel plants can't compete. That's how out of whack the Texas electricity market has become. Since 2006, the state has subsidized renewable energy to the tune of $19 billion. All of this came right out of Texans' wallets, courtesy of ever-increasing electric bills and rising property taxes. And what does Texas have to show for it? An electric grid that failed when Texans needed it most. Unfortunately, this scenario is playing out across America. Over the past decade, the federal government has spent over $230 billion on energy subsidies. And that doesn't even include subsidies the states give away. It's true that Uncle Sam also grants favors to fossil fuel companies. Renewable energy advocates love to point this out. But here's what they neglect to mention. Compared to fossil fuel companies, for every unit of electricity generated, Washington subsidizes wind 17 times and solar 75 times more. Yet despite all this aid, renewables provide just 4% of the country's total energy supply. The verdict is in. Renewable energy is expensive and unreliable. And if it can render America's leading power producer powerless, it can do the same to your state. Government meddling got us into this mess. It's time for politicians to step aside and let the free market get us out of it. I'm Jason Isaac from the Texas Public Policy Foundation for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. Thanks. To keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible <laughs> donation. <laughs>
I think we all support Prager. You know, yeah, well, I, I was surprised they called and said, would you like to come out and work with us on a script and, and talk about this? And I, I went out there in mid-July, and I thought by the time that it's published, it's still not going to be, no one's going to care. It'll be too much time will have passed by. It's still one of the top issues in the state of Texas that we're dealing with, and we still continue to see our grid, even during the summer, go into these situations where we're approaching emergency conservation alerts where we ask people to curtail. That's the first thing that the, the ERCOT does is ask people to quit, turn their thermostats down, adjust them appropriately to use less energy, and then we shut down manufacturing. Uh, and we actually, when we do that, we have contractual agreements with manufacturers that consume a lot of electricity to shut down. Uh, and then ratepayers actually pay them to not use electricity, which is another form of a subsidy, which ratepayers are on the hook for. But interestingly enough, um, you talk about paying customers to take a product, and that restaurant analogy, the freeze started to happen on a Sunday night, February 14th, and then for four days, it was awful. The Friday or Saturday, not even a week later, prices in the ERCOT grid went to negative. So again, wind is paying people to take their product, and natural gas, coal, and nuclear have to do the same thing because of the way the market bids into it. And that's why we've seen a significant decrease over the last 10 years, over 5% of our reliable thermal generation has shut down. And in the same time frame, we've seen a 220% increase of unreliable variable generation. And it's just due to simply the subsidies are there, the dollars are there. That's why when uh, Biden's <coughs> treasurer appointment for the Comptroller Office of Comptroller and Currency uh, is wants to bankrupt oil and gas companies. This is a comment she made recently. It's the oil and gas companies are investing in wind and solar because the money is there to be made from our pocketbooks, our handouts. Uh, interestingly enough, last week I got back from, I was in Rhode Island, uh, in Narragansett, Rhode Island, a couple of weeks ago on a trip, and there, there may be some news coming out of the Texas Public Policy Foundation with our litigation team on a massive wind project that's proposed there because it wasn't good enough for Nantucket, so they had to move it a little bit where the people don't make as much money as they do in Nantucket. And I get back and the Houston Chronicle has this article talking about how Biden is missing this opportunity and Texas is missing this opportunity for coastal wind. And they have a picture of, and they're singing the praises of the Block Island, Rhode Island wind farm, which is five turbines owned and operated by a foreign company. Interesting. And, and I had just gotten back. And so I interacted with Houston Chronicle. Of course, they didn't interact back. But the picture of the five wind turbines, this, the first wind farm in the United States, only one of those wind turbines has been working over the last year. There are exposed power lines. And there are actually pictures in the local newspapers of kids tubing around Block Island. And you can see exposed, massive, high power power lines that they're having to rebury. Interestingly enough, they use horizontal drilling to rebury those. I thought that was a bad term, no matter the depth. Um, but they're using horizontal drilling to rebury those to the tune of what was just doubled from $30 million cost to now $60 million in cost. Uh, and and I, I, one thing I don't like about the Northeast is I have to say they're the highest electric rates in the US, because I prefer to be able to say that to California, but when I talk and bash California policies, I have to say they're the second highest electric rates in the US to the Northeast and where I was a couple weeks ago. But it's really interesting that the Houston Chronicle continues to sing the praises of this unreliable electric generation, especially after we lost what some reports show over 700 lives in February in Texas, proving that cold weather is more important or, or more harmful than warm weather. But the, the, the climate cult, as I refer to them, seem to be so concerned about warming, anthropogenic global warming. But cold is much more dangerous. And, and their figures out there show that for every person that dies from heat illness, 40 people will freeze to death. It's that much more severe. We found out the hard way. Um, one of the things that, the Life Power Project of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, we're, our short mission statement is to raise America's energy IQ. Our longer mission statement is to make the connection between access to affordable, reliable energy and human flourishing. And so we have some messaging points based on years of polling that we continue to update and we ask people and we do some really in-depth modeling to find out about people's ideas and their issues and, and their concerns about energy. And the, the number one mover of people that may be anti 
reliable, affordable, or dense energy, fossil fuels, hydrocarbons, nuclear, is the number one mover to get people to be pro-reliable energy is when you start talking about how expensive energy hurts the poor. And in, when I usually do a presentation, I show a video. It's a UNICEF video, interestingly enough, of a 13-year-old girl from Ethiopia, and her name's Aisha. And I encourage you, it's, it's maybe a minute and a half video, A-Y-S-H-A. -A. You can find it on, uni, on, on YouTube. I don't think UNICEF would ever think that someone would be promoting fossil fuels, uh, would be using a UNICEF video, and I'm surprised they haven't taken it down yet. Uh, but it's this, this girl, she's 13, she walks, and there's timestamps on the videos, eight hours every single day to collect water for her family. That doesn't include the time it takes for her to gather wood, animal dung, or other forms of biomass to heat that water. There's a couple of heartbreaking points in the video for me is, is not only is she walking alone, she's a camel, she has plastic jugs, she fills it up with dirty water from a river, but there's a heartbreaking point to me that's, that shows her younger brother doing homework. And I'm thinking, why can't Aisha be doing homework? And it's because she's responsible for getting water for her family. And when you think about expensive energy hurts the poor, it burdens women more than others around the world. Women spend, we've got a great communications manager on our team, Katie Tawawa, and she went out and wrote a wonderful piece. And it shows that women walk over, spend over 200 million hours a day walking to collect water. That's 200 million hours a day that could be spent furthering their education or getting an education, creating jobs, getting involved in their communities. But Countries like the United States won't loan money to developing company, countries if they're investing in infrastructure based on fossil fuels. And I think that's just discriminatory. It's hurtful. It's harmful. I showed this video to a, a Congressman Dan Crenshaw's staff, and he's got a lady that works for him named Hannah. And Hannah had done missionary work in Ethiopia. And she told me at one point in time, she asked me, she says, what, you, know, you know what technology Aisha does have? And me being naive, I thought a cell phone? And Hannah should have laughed in my face and very plainfully just said, no, she has implantable birth control in her arm because she knows at some point in time she's gonna be attacked on her journey. And that's what the United Nations provides to Hannah, not reliable, affordable electricity. And that's heartbreaking. We should be making funds available. And we had a policy prior to the current administration that would make funds available to developing countries if they were investing in infrastructure based on fossil fuels but that's not the case anymore, and that's heartbreaking to me. So expensive energy hurts the poor, but not only does it hurt the poor in developing countries, it hurts the poor right here in the United States. One in 10 families will get a disconnect notice from a utility over the next 12 months. 30% of Americans will have to choose between paying the utility bill, putting food on their table, or medicine over the next 12 months, and that's harmful. <clears throat> there's a group in California called the 200. And the 200 is over 200 civil rights organizations that for the most part probably don't ideologically align with me. There's a lawsuit. The 200 is suing the California Air Resources Board for violating the Civil Rights Act, saying that the policies of the environmental climate policies of California have a disproportionate impact on communities of color. The lead attorney, again, a civil rights attorney that I probably don't ideologically align with, she refers to their environmental policies as Green Jim Crow. And this is happening right here in the United States, in a state that actually used to not import oil because they produced it all right there. And they're sitting on top of the reserves that they can. And now they're importing oil from Saudi Arabia. And that's why they're undersea pipelines from offshore loading facilities to get oil from ships onshore to refining facilities. And when another boat drags an anchor, and ruptures a pipeline, you have an oil spill in the sea that you didn't have 30 years ago because they weren't importing oil because they didn't need to because they were producing their own. So expensive energy hurts the poor right here in the United States. Our second biggest messaging mover of people that might be anti or just undecided on energy, and I talk to people that work in the energy industry and, 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 and kids in schools uh, all over the state of Texas and, and try to get around the country as much as possible, uh, and my, when I first, first, start, first started with the Texas Public Policy Foundation, I was finishing up my fourth term in the Texas House. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Texas House pays $600 a month. 
Uh, I was struggling to make a living in the trucking industry before getting into politics and mad at some tax changes that happened that directly made it harder for me to provide for my family, so I thought I'd run for office and make a difference. It was really hard to make a living in the legislature. I'm not an attorney, I'm not independently wealthy, and I'm certainly not retired. Um, so $600 a month and then per diems, it was, it was really difficult. Um, but so I was finishing up my fourth term when I didn't run for re-election and I was just starting at the Texas Public Policy Foundation and went to the Capitol in DC. Was meeting with a senior staffer for a US senator that serves on an energy committee. And I said, I'd love to come by your office and talk to you about how America is a world leader in clean air and how at that time we have reduced harmful pollution 73%. Now this is a staffer that laughed in my face. He said, that's, that's funny, where'd you get your numbers from? And I, I thought he was being sarcastic and I was kind of dumbfounded. I said, the World Health Organization and the Environmental Protection Agency? And he was, he was serious. He goes, really? I'm, Absolutely, and that number is down 78% now. We've reduced harmful pollution in this country 78%. We actually import pollution from Asia. It doesn't make it this far east, it makes it as far east as Denver and Houston. So you're, you're blessed to be this far east because you're not being impacted by Asian air pollution, but the, the western half of the United States is. It's a 65% increase in ozone in California that's attributed to Asian air pollution. You have a, a pollution that's hitting Washington and Oregon that's dangerous levels of lead and mercury that's coming across. So when we increase regulations here in the United States and shift our manufacturing overseas, we're actually exporting jobs and importing the pollution. And that's bad, and we've advocated, we're not big fans of the Paris Climate Accord, uh, not, not too concerned about CO2. I drink a lot of Topo Chico and LaCroix and sparkling water and ingest higher concentrations of CO2 than what's in the atmosphere, and I don't spontaneously combust, uh, although I'm sure some people on the left would like that I would, but it just doesn't happen. We, we, and we don't conflate harmful pollution with greenhouse gases. There's, there's two distinct separations there, but we've advocated for our trading partners to meet our air quality standards. We're the only country in the world of a population of greater than 50 million people that meet the World Health Organization's uh, safe air requirements. The only country, over 50 million people. And that's fantastic. Shouldn't China and India and all of Europe meet the World Health Organization's criteria for safe air quality? We should be calling on our trading partners to get to there to actually improve human health. So that, that's uh, the second messaging point that I wanted to share with you, that we're a world leader in clean air Many of you know that we're number one in access to clean and safe drinking water, something that has changed significantly over the last 40 years. I think before 1980, uh, it was less than 40% of the communities met the lowest standards for safe and clean water, and today it's over 90% of the communities meet the highest standards for safe and clean water. That's a good position to be in. Shouldn't people like Aisha have access to clean and safe drinking water? And you need energy to do that. And you need, you absolutely need that. You look at some other UNICEF videos, you'll see green treetops. That means there's water in the soil. But we have these policies that discriminate against people like Aisha, and I wanna bring the rest of the world up. I want them actually being high carbon lifestyle because that's where you start to get a clean environment, clean water, clean air with a high carbon lifestyle. So those are just some messaging points that I wanted to share with you a little bit about some of the policies that we work for uh, within the Texas Public Policy Foundation. We are a national initiative, so we work in other states, we work across the country, and we work in D.C. on getting good policies, good free market policies out of the way that hopefully will lead to lower cost and higher reliability of electricity for generations to come, because as we found in February, people can't survive without reliable electricity. <laughs> Thank you. Those were Thank your you. directions. So I have a, a, a quick question. If you'll if, just tell us a little about your organization and how you saw the need for that before we move on to David. Yeah, our organization used to be called, within the Texas Public Policy Foundation, we've been around just a little over 30 years. We got founded on working on school choice in Texas, and it's, it's depressing to come here because, yes, we think everything's bigger and better than Texas, and we come here and we have so little school choice. Uh, in Texas. We have charter schools and public schools, and actually charter schools are public charter schools. Um, so that's how our organization got started. We've got a lot of work to do in that front, and I'm just angered, especially after having served in the legislature uh, and supporting school choice every single session against the recommendations of uh, my Republican colleagues, against the recommendations from my Democrat <coughs> colleagues, but I messaged it well to our school districts and to our kids and our families, and they reelected me several times. 
Um, but that's how our organization got started. Then this initiative called Life Powered got started about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, called Fueling Freedom, and it was really to take on the federal government and their efforts with a clean power plan, which we saw would significantly increase the cost of electricity, would not improve the environment, uh, and, and those lead to much, much higher costs that would hurt Americans around the country. And so we were successful in those efforts, even though the current administration is trying to bring some of those policies back in place uh, to the detriment of the environment and to humans, especially the ones that live here in the United States. So uh, we rebranded a few years ago, right before I start, again, life powered, and that's, we, we just try to fight bad policies around the country and promote good policies like our grid firming requirement language that we are working for in Texas and other states uh, around the country to make sure that <clears throat> if we're gonna put variable sources of electric generation on the grid, that they're able to provide electricity on demand when people need it, not when the wind blows and not when the sun shines. And I think that that should be something, uh, as we see in Texas, our ERCOT grid is now 33% of variable unreliable sources that at most in the highest year have produced 25% of our electricity needs. And you saw on the video in February, uh, got to as low as one and a half percent of our electric generation. One and a half percent and they're 33% of our grid. And that's it's funny, the wind advocates and lobby were trashing me on Twitter uh, that week as I was talking about frozen wind turbines. And they were saying, we are exceeding expectations. We are exceed, er, ERCOT had only prepared, you know, planned on us providing one and a half percent of the electricity. And so we're, at some points in time, they were just over one and a half percent. And so they were patting themselves on the back while people are literally freezing to death, saying they're exceeding expectations at one and a half percent. And I'm thinking, I sure hope you aren't raising kids. <clears throat> Not with being happy about that low of expectations and praising yourself for exceeding them when they're that low. But we have become way too dependent on variable sources of electric generation. Uh, and so we are advocating now strongly for a reliability firming requirement within the grid that if you want to put electricity on the grid, then you need to be able to meet a commitment for 48 hours of your average load, because that's what our grid forecast is going to be available, the average electricity from wind and solar, which Y'all are probably pretty good at math. You know, half the time you're going to be below average or 49.99% of the time you're going to be below average. So we just want them to be able to have reliable electricity on the grid. And the wind industry has been talking for decades about how we can partner with natural gas. And so now hopefully in Texas, we'll give them that opportunity and they will build some natural gas quick start backup generation uh, to make sure that we have reliable electricity when we need it, not just when the wind blows or sun shines. Thank you. Um, David, if you would come up and tell us how we're going to save the world in Georgia oh, yeah. and um, why none of this is going to happen to us. Give us some context. I will. <laughs> Do I just hit forward? There. So I, now you get the brittle engineering graphic numbers that I really need to call Dennis Prager on and have run through and get one of those cool videos, Jason, <laughs> that you've got. Because I, I can't measure up to that show. Um, but what I want to do is kind of to, be, to Benita's point, I want to put this in a broader context, talk about reliability. I'm going to talk about the, the state of Georgia, the country, and I'm going to probably get into a little bit about what's going on in the world, not a whole lot, but I do want to put this in context because the policies that we're crafting both in Georgia and in the country need to be in that context. So I'm going to push through pretty quickly through with some numbers, with some figures. And what I want you to notice, lots of, there'll be several graphs. Just notice the trends. You'll see things going up and things going down. I'll get to some bar graphs, some charts in just a little bit. We're going to talk about these various resources and what they actually can contribute to a grid. Jason talked a lot about reliability and about wind and solar. I'm going to put it in terms of capacity factors, things that look to where you can actually visualize what these are doing. This is total U.S. energy consumption. And, and again, I'll talk about this in terms of total energy, and then we'll talk about power generation. You can see right now we're at about, for the, for the country, 78.5% fossil fuels. Um, and, and again, down here, and I'll break this up, hydro, non-hydro, when we get to the grid, I'll talk about solar and wind separately. But this is total non-hydro, we're looking at 9.7%, and that includes biomass, geothermal, and everything else. Notice the trend, coal is going down. Engineering world, that's baseload power. Natural gas is tacking up. Uh, and you'll see the dip here in those from 2019 to 2020. Oil, natural gas, both went down pretty steeply. 
So if you really want to cut back on your fossil fuels, what you do is you shut down your economy and you'll get an immediate drop pretty much in just about everything. Um, this is our electricity profile. Uh, again, coal's going down. Natural gas is replacing that for the most part. Our biggest non-renewable in the country is wind. Right now it's sitting at about 8.4%. Again, this is just for the electricity profile. And again, as an engineer, as somebody from the power sector, as uh, several of you may be, we're losing baseload coal. The only option up here for replacing that baseload is nuclear. It's flat as a flitter right now. You'll see some numbers for Georgia a little bit different. And oddly, um, in my space, solar is the one that gets most of the attention, probably because we're here in Georgia and that's our only renewable resource, but really it's not the one pull, uh, carrying water up the hill. This is Georgia's electric power sector. Right now, we're at about 45% gas, and you can see that trend. If you want to get a comparison, and I've got a figure later in the very back side of these slides that I won't get to, if you want to get a comparison for a state that's really tacking hard into the natural gas space, look at Florida. I think they're in the 75% range right now. Um, coal is going down, not increasing nuclear. And every time I'm down there talking with those folks, their comment is, you know, it takes a whole bunch of pipes bent from the Gulf of Mexico to get down into Florida, and it worries us to death. So we're shifting over, and again, I'll look at this in a little more detail in a minute, from a storable on-site baseload resource like coal to a flow-dependent resource like natural gas. And we've seen with the Colonial Pipeline recently exactly what we can run into. So as long as the pipe's full and it's flowing, things are great, and natural gas is, is running slick. But let those pipes back up or stop or valves close or we have bad weather in Texas, like we did this past winter, and we're going to struggle. So you see here Vogel 3 and 4. This is me with a poor projection out of what we're looking at for nuclear generation in the state here increasing once we get those two reactors online. That's going to really make up a lot for what we're losing in that coal space right there for base load power. Um, this is where we are in Georgia for our capacity. We're at about, and again, this is not generation, this is capacity. We're about 47% capacity on natural gas. You see the numbers there. Coal continues to drop. Uh, nuclear's been steady for some time. And solar capacity again at 5.5%. Um, this is, and this will get to a little bit of what Jason talked about, particularly on the prices. You can't see this probably too well, maybe on this monitor. Uh, this, this will be available. You can have this entire uh, PowerPoint when it's all over. But what I've done here is go around and look at uh, the, the, res uh, the portfolios for the various regions around the country. And for the most part, you can see which states depend on it, primarily the coal, nuclear, natural gas part. Um, and you can look at what I want to do now, though, is kind of break it out and look at something, again, that Jason pointed out. These are the, these are the um, 2020 residential rates around the country. The number that he pointed to and talked about as far as up in the northeast there, I think that number up in New England, 21.2 cents per kilowatt hour. Over on the west coast there in California, it says 16.67 cents, and it is. But if you take Washington and Oregon out of that, uh, California jumps back into the lead and is running neck and neck with its northeast brethren up there. It's really high in California, really high up in uh, the northeast there. You can see down in the, if it's got the word south in it, the rates are pretty low. And Benita, if you think you have a southern accent, you don't. That's why I'm here. Okay? <laughs> We've got good rates in Georgia. Now, look at the solar resource where it's located, and again, those numbers is the percent share. So up in that mountain region, over in the Pacific, and then up in New England, those are the highest, the regions with the highest uh, solar penetration. If we look at wind, it's right through the midsection of the country there, down in Jason's neck of the woods, they're at about 17%, and this again is just for the power sector. And up in the west, north, central, they're, they're pushing 30%. There are states up there, Iowa, in particular that's up in the 35% range for its wind production. The one that's probably um, more problematic is looking up in that northeast there for the nuclear dependency. And I've got nuclear dependency here. It's not so much that their nuclear resource is higher percent share-wise up there than it is down here in Georgia. 
but it is for some numbers I'm going to show you in just a little bit. They are shutting down nuclear reactors in that space up there. And they are not building coal plants, as you can imagine. So they're going to really be struggling and facing some serious decisions in the future as they lose something as dependable as nuclear and um, have state mandates for low carbon renewable portfolio standards that are just in conflict. Uh, these are residential rates. I took the top 15 state GDPs. This will give a little bit of context here as far as what it costs, and I just showed you those from the census regions. But here, uh, Georgia, of course, Texas, I think what, Jason, one or two GDP, number one, number two, one of the two. I think Georgia's sitting at number eight. But the, the red dash line there is the average U.S. residential rate, and you can see that Georgia here is well below that and consistently below that. So not only are we providing good, reliable electricity here in the state, but it's also very affordable and much cheaper than it is across the country. Now, I wanna, I'm going to break this down. I want to talk about these resources independently. I'm going to look at wind. I want to look at solar. And then I'm going to move over into a little space and talk about capacity factors for each of these technologies. Um, right now, again, the narrative, and Benita, that was my point in talking about narratives. There are narratives. If, if you're in the energy policy space, there are many narratives, social media. I mean, it's just... It, it is just cranking up with what we can do with certain resources. And most of the time, uh, it's not backed up with physics or math or calculators or things like that. But when we talk about something like wind generation in the, in, in the U.S., just it's worth noting that almost 74% of wind power in the country is just from nine states. Just from nine states. It's, it makes sense. Because when you look at the wind resource itself, it's just right through that midsection. So the states with the stars there are the states I had on the previous graph. And then, of course, you got California. They don't, it doesn't matter to them whether the resource is available or not. They're going to get it somehow. But that's where the resource is. To connect that resource to population centers, again, it's going to take tremendous transmission capacity to get that done. If we look at the solar resource, 77%, again, nine different states except for California, it's still in there. But just notice California is sitting there and about 37% of the country's solar generation is in that one state. And again, they have third or fourth highest residential rates in the country. And they have regular problems with reliability. They too, not perhaps the same as South Africa, Bonita, but they do also somewhat use rolling blackouts as a demand side management tool. And again, you look at the solar resource, this is where the resource is, where those states are. If you'll notice over here on the East Coast where Georgia and South Carolina are two of the leading states, what that is, particularly I can speak for Georgia, that is calculated, meticulous, steady, conservative integration of solar resource. It's not step function change, jumping off a cliff, let's force it down the throats of the utilities and the MEAGs and Oglethorpe Power. Let's slowly integrate this into our resource base so that it actually works. Good job for Georgia in this space. Now these are the, com the performance capacity. This, so I'm going to look at this again, just a nerdy way of looking at this based on what the operational characteristics are of these resources. I ain't going to spend a lot of time. That's a, that's a, this is a college professor trying to teach his students something. So we're not going to spend a lot of time. But what I do want you to notice from this table, I've got the resources on that left column. That next column there about type, I'm just talking about is it storable on the plant site? Is it flow dependent? And is it intermittent? You know what those are. Storable is coal and nuclear right there on, on the plant site. That's reliability built in, not to the power generator, but to the resource itself. Natural gas, which I love. It's, it's been a godsend for this country, but nonetheless, it has its shortcomings. If the pipes aren't flowing, we're gonna have a problem at the plant. Then we've got down here where solar and wind, again, resources that we need to develop the technology for, along with the battery storage capabilities, but they are both flow dependent and intermittent. So I'm gonna look at those capacity factors resource by resource. Now these are going to be several graphs, same kinds of graphs over and over and over. I'm going to start with residential solar PV and you can see I've got this laid out from January to December. All that I'm projecting in these figures 
is the, the larger bar, the complete bar, is the capacity for this resource, in this case, residential rooftop solar. The colored space is how much of that capacity was actually generating electricity. So here, just for example, the month of January, this is for the entire U.S., rooftop solar, we got a 12.7% utility or capacity factor for that month out of rooftop solar. And you can see how it moves there from May, I mean, from January through December, peaks in June. And the capacity factor for the year there at the top, it's 18.3%. So I'm going to move through these kind of quickly, rooftop, residential, solar. If we shift that up to utility scale, that capacity factor for the year bumps up to 25, uh, 24.9. That's a 50% increase going from rooftop to letting the utilities develop some economy of scale on this. Again, uh, more utility out of the solar resource there than it is at the distributed level. If we look at wind generation, capacity factor here a little bit better, mainly because the wind, wind is just a better, more consistent resource than sun is. Guaranteed, the sun's not gonna shine at night. Wind, you, you possibly could get some variability there, but you, know, you can see it here, the capacity factor is about 35.5%. Coal generation, this is continuing to drop. This is not represented of the, coal, of the resource and the technology itself. This is projecting dialing back coal plants. That's what this is primarily showing. If we look at hydro, we're not going to build any more in the U.S., but this is what we've got now. It's about 41.5 percent. Now, this is the one that we're, we're building out in the country. This has been, you know, thank goodness what we went through back in, you know, 2005 to 2010 with fracking and, Jason, as you pointed out, horizontal drilling. If we had not develop this technology and unlock these resources, I don't know what kind of political fight we'd be in right now over coal. I don't know where we'd be. <clears throat> but these natural gas, and these are particularly combined cycle plants where the uh, efficiency is, is much, much higher, around 50%. This is going to be what we're going to build out quite a bit of uh, for the next decade or two. And then here's my favorite, nuclear 92.5% uh, stuff just runs. You turn it on, the dang things just run. They run. The only time they're not running is we're going to have to do some refueling. And you can see there where they drop down in the spring and fall time when we've got lower demand, which we're going to work on refueling across the country during those times. Quick figure, <clears throat> this is just, uh, you know, again, a quick exercise. A lot of times I hear folks compare when we talk about replacing maybe 50 megawatt or, excuse me, 500 megawatts of coal or 500 megawatts of natural gas, we're going to put in 500 megawatts of solar. This is just one of those, you know, do the math thing. Uh, up here on the top left, you can see you, you really don't replace capacity. What you're really looking for here is generation. So if, we're, if we really are going to try and replace 500 megawatts of nuclear power with 500 megawatts of utility scale PV, we are not going to get, because of those capacity factors, but about one-fourth of the output not to mention the massive footprint that it's going to take for 500 megawatts of solar. So my only point here is that when we're going to compare these, at a minimum, we compare them based on generation output. And beyond that, we still need to look at the lifetime of the plant. A nuclear plant is going to last us six decades. My grandchildren will use electricity from Bogle 3 and 4. It's going to take a couple of lifetimes for an equivalent amount of solar or wind or natural gas to equal that. There's a resource here that we're developing, needs to be developed more in the U.S. Uh, that's got a, it's got long-term value added. Now, oh gosh, I thought I was being young. Narrative. Renewables are growing exponentially. This is the world. And, I, I do, and you know what? If you look at the graph, they are growing exponentially. There's no argument there. But when we put this in context, that is globally, if we put the, the exponential growth in context with fossil fuels, which, you, you know, the, the, the contention is that we can replace fossil fuels with renewable. You look at all the capacity factors that we just talked about, it's just not going to happen. And not only can it not happen, it, it ain't happening. Here, that gap 
between the renewables and the fossil fuels is continuing to expand. That dip there from 19 to 20 is already projected to go back up in 2021 because economies are cranking back up. They have to have reliable power. So that gap is going to continue to increase. So the growth in renewables is fine and good, but it's not displacing fossil fuels. <clears throat> Where is it happening, that exponential growth globally? I'm going to show you two tables, and all I want you to do is look at the red dotted areas. For solar generation 2019, 79% of it was in those nine countries. Those nine countries, if you look over on the far right, represent about 63% of global GDP. Those are wealthy countries. They also, in that middle red box, have a substantial industrial base of fossil fuels, nuclear, and hydro, those traditional resources that once you get that base built, you can experiment with nuclear, I mean with renewables on top of that. You've got some headspace. Make a mistake, you fall down, you pick yourself back up. Emerging economies where most of the fossil fuel growth is and where the carbon emission concerns are, they're not doing this because they can't. You've got to have an industrial base that's going to support it. Same thing for wind, same table, a couple of different countries included. I'm going to close out with a couple of things about uh, the, the industrial supply chain for renewables. Um, you don't get something for nothing. If we shift over and if the trend is to move from fossil fuels to, to renewables, and I am a supporter of renewables, I worked on a project on campus at the university for a one megawatt solar farm that we studied for several years. But if we're going to switch over to this, keep in mind, we're going to shift our dependencies from fossil fuels to an industrial supply chain that is going to demand enormous minerals, rare earths, and metals. If we look at those based on technologies, that mineral intensity is much greater for the renewable technologies than it is for the traditional. It's not to say we don't pursue renewables, it's just that if we're going to do that, we have to take into consideration that map right there. Where are we going to get those minerals? Well, right now, the U.S. doesn't have the supply chain to stand it up. We're going to be importing those from other countries China being one of the, uh, the biggest suppliers, our dependency shifts. So there is no, no matter what the narrative may be, renewables are not limitless. They are completely limited by our access to the mineral industrial supply chain. I'm going I'm to, I'm real fast, I'm going to get through. I want to show <coughs> one, I want to show one quick graph. This is what we're doing in nuclear in the U.S., Russia, China space, Benita. This gets to the national security part. We used to dominate back before 2000, nuclear construction. It was America. Since 2000, it has been Russia and China. We've got two or one project in the U.S. since, what, 1978 or 9? And that's right over here in Augusta. If we look at all nuclear construction starts and connections to the grid since 2000, 155 reactors, 105 of those are Chinese and Russian, not U.S. We are shutting down reactors across the country. We've retired 11. I actually had to shift those up, you know, to the top. They've just recently been. We've shut down and retired 11. We've retired Indian Point. We've got others. 16 reactors there in the bottom for state action. Most of those in those regions that I pointed out earlier about the nuclear dependency, that is a problem. Not only grid reliability wise, and if you look at, and this is my last graph, but then I'm gonna sit down and shut up. If you look at that blue line, that is nuclear power generation in the US since 1969. If we just let the existing plants retire after 60 years, normal retirement, the blue line after about 2030 is what we see. We have no plan for how to backfill that much zero carbon based load power. We don't have a plan. And again, renewables aren't going to do it. The more worrisome national security concern is, is that as our nuclear expertise declines, China's increases. So if I, that asymmetry, um, last slide, is a national security concern. And it's not just my opinion. That is the most <clears throat> valuable energy technology on earth. And we are vacating 
the space. So I'm going to end. And I didn't even name a water. <laughs> Thank you. So for you, David. Uh, Ma'am? Quick question, and you don't have to get up to answer it. Is there ever going to be another nuclear plant built in this country? So you want me to be which prophet or here or what? I, what do we I, don't need so prophets. Here, here, we need realists. Okay, here, so here, here we are. Um, I, I think that what we're going to do is our next, um, our next series of nuclear projects are going to be either small modular or they're going to be what's referred to as molten salt reactors. They're still smaller. Scale's a lot lower, a lot smaller. Um, but what, what, they, what, what we can do with those, for one thing, there's a lot more uh, passive safety features on those. And, and I'll just give one example. I'll give one example. So, so I'm going to quickly answer your question. We are. We're going to build them. They're going to be smaller. And they're going to be much more advanced as far as um, uh, the types of coolant that we're using. Uh, maybe later we can talk about the one that they're actually looking at constructing out in Wyoming. It's the Natrium Reactor. It's got uh, some features on it as far as, uh, it's actually a heat battery, but you can, you can run this reactor 24 seven like reactors love to do, but instead of necessarily dispatching electricity from that, that heat in, uh, you know, converting, you know, tr uh, moving water from, from water to steam and driving a turbine, you actually can store that heat in a, in a vat of molten salt and use it at will, you can use it for power generation, you can use it for industrial process, and you can use it for things like desalination. And, and Jason, it's, it's probably, in my opinion, going to be a godsend for, for countries that um, may be looking for something really, really reliable and are underwater stress, mm -hmm. because desalination is going to be a problem in the future. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you. It was kind of winded. <laughs> And that's fine. We have time. Um, <laughs> I've said that our GDP, our, our nuclear growth should be following GDP or, or our population growth. We should see, and we haven't seen that in Texas, where it, 5 percent of our grid has been nuclear for the last 20 years. But our population, our GDP, our electric use has, has gone up significantly. And really, that baseload nuclear should be following those lines, and we should be growing more. It's great for baseload electricity. It's great for frequency control. <laughs> which I don't want to get too technical and talk about frequency, but there may be one or two people um, <clears throat> that, that kind of know what I'm talking about. And this happened in February where our electric use, the demand started to increase significantly around midnight, 1 a.m. on February 15th, 1 a.m. And you had power plants that were starting to increase the rate of spin on their turbines to keep the frequency up because as people were pulling electricity off the grid, the frequency was starting to drop. And as those turbines start to spin faster and faster, their safety mechanism built in them, they trip offline and it's like throwing a breaker. Now with a, it happens with a coal plant and it did, then you take all that available electricity off the grid and that power plant won't come back online for a couple of days. With natural gas, you had natural gas power plants trip offline. That meant another hit to available electricity on our grid. Uh, and that's why we need more of these reliable sources like nuclear on uh, the grids around the country to make sure that we have that frequency. And that's why we were within four minutes of a complete grid collapse in Texas because our frequency got too low. Um, and that's why we had to do the rolling outages. And they weren't rolling. We just, uh, ERCOT started ordering shutdowns and people had to start shutting people off to force demand lower. <clears throat> if that hadn't happened, we would have had an absolute grid collapse. We were within in, in four minutes of that happening. We would still be rebuilding Texas today. It takes, you, you talk months to rebuild a grid after you have a collapse like that. It would have been devastating. And you think about all the refined energy products that are refined in Texas, how devastating that would have been to the United States. And we're, we've, we've, we've gambled. So hindsight being 2020, did anybody see this coming in Texas? Did anybody warn? And what was the proposed solution? If anybody did come up and say, 
we're in trouble. We're heading for trouble. Yeah, unfortunately, I had written something. I say unfortunately because I, I, my wife and our boys were absolutely blessed. We never lost electricity. We never lost natural gas. We didn't lose internet, which meant that I had legislators that were staying at our house. I had a bunch of high school boys that were staying at our house and coming over and taking hot showers, and so the house didn't smell real great at one point in time. Um, but we were blessed that we had to do that. And I, I say I was blessed because I was on TV and radio in my home office all day, every day during that week of the, the blackouts. I had written a piece in July of 2020, months before the blackouts, warning that we don't have enough ele a reliable electricity on our grid and that ERCOT, the Electric Liability Council of Texas, was doing their calculations wrong and doing them saying that well, we're, we anticipate that half the 50% of the capacity of, of wind and solar are gonna show up. And so we've got this huge cush reserve margin of 15 to 19%. And they were, and I kept saying that that's inaccurate. They're doing math wrong. Uh, and we don't have that much electricity and we are a threat. And if it wasn't for COVID shutdowns in 2020, we would have had rolling outages and blackouts in August. And that's what my July piece warned of in, in saying we should be fine in August. And I was almost wrong because we almost had rolling outages in August of 2020 with the COVID shutdowns. And that should have been a huge wake up call to our public utility commissioners, to ERCOT to, to, and, and businesses on the grid. And the interesting thing is my first legislative session, I was not even a month in office in February 2011 and we had blackouts. We had a big severe freeze, not as bad as the one we just had earlier this year. And then we passed all these laws to protect, you know, try to keep this from happening again. And it's those, some of those laws weren't implemented. Nothing happened. We should have learned our lesson, but we've advocated for reliable electricity on our grid, to make variable sources, put reliable electricity on our grid. No one would pay attention to me on that particular policy recommendation that we had starting in 2020 until about February 15th. And then while I was doing interviews, I have legislators calling me and they're at my house asking me, how do we fix this? And I'm like, well, here's a, here's a paper I wrote last year. We can start here. <laughs> uh, and so hopefully some of those processes, because the legislature's tough, it's difficult, wind lobby strong, solar lobby strong, um, and they passed some bills that said the PUC, the Public Utility Commission, may implement market reform policies uh, that put the cost of, of, uh, on variable sources of electric generation. Uh, and then the governor came out on July 6, days after our legislative session or one of our legislative sessions ends and says the PUC shall do this. And he's ordered them to do it. We'll know by December 19th or 20th if we get to praise them or publicly shame them because it will be one or the other. So um, I have some questions from the audience. And basically, it's Vogel, Vogel, Vogel. <laughs> Um, but one of the questions is, what is the status of um, Vogel's new reactor? Um, I'm, I, I, I can't speak for the company, of course, but yes. it seems like it's, it's been moved to some time later this year. Benita, I'm, yeah. I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure exactly what the, the new date is, but I know it's pushed back a little bit. Well, uh, a follow-up question on that. What can we do to bring down the cost of nuclear construction? Um, you know, with, with, with Vogel, we understand the issues that came into play. Fukushima, um, Westinghouse going bankrupt, um, COVID interrupting the workforce. Uh, but in <coughs> big picture, how do we bring down the cost of, of, um, of nuclear construction, plan construction? Well, if, well, to the point I made earlier, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to move probably likely towards advanced reactors. They're going to be smaller scale. Uh, but, but what we have to do, just like with any, any construction, I mean, building nuclear power plants is hard. It's hard stuff. It's hard work. But we've got to get a book of business built out so that we can come up a learning curve and increase the efficiencies here. There is a learning curve there where you error, error generation, error correction. Once you get out to, what, 10, maybe 15 reactors built, you're, you're pretty much on a glide path at that point. Uh, but another thing that would be helpful here is we've, we, we need to update our regulatory guardrails on this um, so that as we move into this advanced reactor phase, the guardrails are 
commensurate with this new technology and <clears throat> um, not as onerous, not, um, there, there's a lot of room, a lot of costs that we can save up front in that regulatory space if, if we can update the, those constraints. I'm struggling with a little bit of a, in fact, they brought me some Altoids up here a while ago. <laughs> a little bit of a tickle in my throat. We have a very supportive audience, so <clears throat> yeah, we thank do. you. And I appreciate it. Well, we, we, we're, just, we're going to have to have some experience with this. We haven't built reactors in 30 years, um, come up the learning curve. America can do this. We can do it on a big scale, and we can do it economically. We just got to have the glide path to get it done. So and I'll add, you need to send signals to the market as well, and the signals that are being sent to the market now are invest in wind and solar. <laughs> And it's because there's a return on investment. That's why oil and gas companies are investing in wind and solar. That's uh, why foreign companies, we had a Chinese company bought 140,000 acres of land in West Texas and was gonna build one of the largest wind farms in the country. Do we, do we really wanna be subsidizing the Communist Party of China? I don't think we do. And so we actually had to, our legislature had to pass a bill banning foreign companies from connecting to our grid. There's some really, talk about national security issues. When you've got a foreign company that knows what's going on in your grid and what the load demands are, you could spoof frequency really easy with a cyber attack and shut down our grid and shut down our economy. We shouldn't be allowing foreign companies, especially countries to connect to our grid. We should be doing that here in the United States. But the signals are being, aren't being sent to the market. Fortunately, there are some signals that are being sent in Texas to investors that it's likely the PUC, PUC may adopt some rules that means that natural gas and coal and, and nuclear and biomass could actually make money in that market again. Because you look from 2012 to 2019, combined cycle gas power plants, the most efficient plants in the state of Texas, they made profit one month. And that was August of 2019. That's hard to operate in a, in a climate like that. But now we've seen just in the last four weeks, we've seen three new power plants that have been mothballed come back online in Texas. One biomass that burns wood pellets, uh, which is interesting because if you're concerned about CO2, that's twice the CO2 emissions of coal, which is twice the CO2 of natural gas. I'll, you know, I'm sure everybody in COP26 wasn't drinking Pellegrino or Perrier, um, ingesting high concentrations of CO2. No way, that wasn't happening. <clears throat> Um, but that's interesting. And then we had two natural gas plants that came on uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. They're smaller scale, but rather than being mothballed and sometimes operational, they will now be operational year-round because there's signals that are being sent to the market that reliable electricity will be an opportunity for businesses to make money in again, which is a good thing. And so hopefully we can send some signals to the market that maybe it's time to reinvest in nuclear and small modular reactors so that we see those investments taking place in the U.S., not in China or other foreign countries. So let me, I want to add a little bit th to that as well. Uh, one, one of the issues, not one of the issues, but one of the unfair comparisons, nuclear is probably one of the, I mean, it, it, as far as the, the fuel resource, uh, the plant operation, and then the waste. Nuclear has to pay for that. I mean, we've been paying, customers across the country have been paying a fee for nuclear waste since I cannot even remember the date to construct a, a waste facility in Nevada, and it's never, it hasn't happened, probably won't happen in my lifetime. My point here is we should also close the cycle on any technology, solar and wind in particular as well, so that those waste costs from those technologies are also rolled back in to the cost of that electricity that's coming from. That's, that full cycle for those renewable technologies is not treated the same way as it is for the nuclear fuel cycle. Okay. Um, we have yet to see what a generation of solar and wind waste is going to co cost us, but it's gonna cost something. And that's not rolled back into the price of electricity like it is for nuclear. Um, we would have had Public Service Commissioner Fitz Johnson here, but unfortunately he had a conflict and it would have been a really great idea to know um, exactly how Georgia regulators ensure that we have the kind of reliable grid that continues with us being the number one for business and, and, and reliable <laughs> through all seasons. Texas, number one. 
Number one. <laughs> We've got an article that says otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> the media, you can't trust the media these days. <laughs> Which media and, we can. And, and so this is going to be my last question because I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So um, one, of the, one of the challenges that we have in the reliable grid, the, the energy security, is <clears throat> that narrative out there. So we know, for example, that China has built several of the the Vogel type reactors already. The, the um, couple, yeah. And 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 it's it's just surging ahead and yet um, we are constantly maligned in the United States for, for for our energy mix and 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 as Jason was saying, you know, we're, one, we're cleanest in the in mm -hmm. the world. How do we overcome that narrative of COP26 and and um, a, the narrative that goes into the media that is not the truth. How do we, how do we overcome it? We have a, a receptive audience sitting here, but um, they're not the ones who turn up at the PSC meetings and... and um, so I want to take that. Can I take that first? Please do. You go first. So just to level set this, um, I, I am one of those people that accepts the fact that climate's changing and there are issues that we have to deal with. Um, when you look at the numbers, however, and, and, and I have a graph, but I didn't show it. <laughs> but the, the, the increase in CO2 emissions, and I think we're all well, well aware of this, is coming from those emerging economies. That's where it's coming from. And the reason is because they are using reliable electricity. Now, here, here are some options. We've got options here. We still have technologies out there that we can develop and we should develop. What we shouldn't do, to your point, is tell those countries we're not going to help you anymore in the fossil fuel space. That is, that is tone deaf. It is. And if you've been to those countries, you realize how tone deaf and almost heartless that is. We still, no matter what the naysayers may say about carbon capture and storage, it's still an option that we can develop. There are still nuclear reactors that we can construct. Um, the narrative right now is, you know, the U.S. needs to provide leadership in CO2 reduction. You look at the numbers, 91% of CO2 emissions since 2000 have been from the emerging economies. The U.S. and Europe are the only two regions where those emissions have decreased. The, again, the point is not blaming anybody. They're doing what they need to do to develop an economy and feed their people. We're able to do it because our economy's old. So if, you, if you've got these two options, if it's a triage situation and you've got countries with high CO2 emissions and CO2 is what you're worried about, and then you've got countries that are healthy, where do you focus your attention for investment? Not grants, not throwing money, but investing in lower carbon natural gas, nuclear, smaller nuclear, and carbon cash, you, you go towards the region where it's most acute. The COP26, I don't think focused on it that way. Maybe, maybe something came out of it that I missed. But as long as we talk about leadership being strictly reducing more CO2 in the U.S., we are reducing CO2. Leadership needs to be projected by engagement in those emerging economies with reliable, lower, not zero necessarily, but lower carbon and zero carbon being nuclear. And where renewables fit in, they fit in. Jason, the final word from you. Yeah, I, I've got so much to add here. It's, I, just, I just finished reading a book uh, by Vivek Ramaswamy. It's, it's Woke Inc., I think, is the name of the book. And he talks about in the book how you've got people that if they fail to persuade you, they move to punishment. And I, I, I'm a sales and marketing professional. I love communication. I think it deals a lot with messaging. And on the panel before this, we had a representative that supports school choice that I believe is a Democrat and gets beat up from probably teachers associations or unions for her position on school choice. And for me, in Texas, our, our position on school choice for rural Republicans was to oppose it because the school districts are the largest employers and it's gonna kill the school districts. And I represented a rural county. And the rural county would tell me, you know, Jason, we love everything you're doing except for your position on school choice. And I say, we've well, got great schools, right? And they say, absolutely. And I said, you're, are you worried about students leaving? 
if we enact school choice, they would never admit that they were worried about that. They just had this position because they were being told from their associations to oppose it at all cost. And, and I, I thought, no, I, I really, I, I don't think you're gonna lose students because it's got such a great school district here that you'll actually probably gain students from other school districts or maybe students that are in private schools that are geographically close enough will wanna come to your public schools because they'll have that option now. And so it's about persuasion and it's messaging but unfortunately, we're seeing the left move to punishment. And I've got a couple of copies of papers here called Corporate Collusion, Liability Risks for the ESG Agenda to Charge Higher Fees and Rig the Market. ESG, if you don't know, I call it Expensive, Scarce, and Government Controlled. It's environmental, social, and governance scoring that's being pushed on corporations. And there's a few different scoring agencies out there. <laughs> that this new market has come around, that you'll see companies like Chevron. One agency, they'll have an A, another one, they'll have a C, and another one, they'll have an F. And then three scoring, three agencies will rate Tesla. One of them will have an A, one of them will have a C, and one of them will give Tesla an F. <coughs> it, it, it's just absolutely absurd, but then you have people like Larry Fink, president, CEO, chairman of BlackRock Financial. BlackRock, and he addressed the, G, the COP26 summit last week or maybe it was earlier this week, and saying that we have got to move money out of reliable energy sources, not his words, my words, into unreliable energy sources. And he's doing it with our money. He's got Brian Deese, who used to drive the investment portfolio for their green energy, who's now the economic advisor for President Biden. He worked in the Obama administration, went and made millions at BlackRock, to drive divestment from pension funds that they manage, from 401ks that they manage, into this, what I refer to as green bling and renewable dreams, these bad investments to prop them up with our dollars. And now he's leading the Economic Council, which by the way, I know this, this administration touts itself as the most open and transparent administration ever. You can't subject, the, uh, Brian Deese, National Economic Council, is not subject to open records requests. You can send all the FOIAs you want and you're not going to get anything back because they don't have to respond. That's not open and transparent. Where are our tax dollars? Where are our ERISA dollars going? <clears throat> well, I'll give you one example. CalSTRS, the California State Teacher Retirement System, is boycotting fossil fuels. They have a billion and a half dollars in that fund in China Construction Company, which builds, operates, and maintains coal-fired power plants in China. But wait, I thought they were boycotting fossil fuels. No, they're just boycotting American fossil fuels. Fossil fuels that are produced more responsibly, arguably, than anywhere else in the world. And I've joked with members of Congress, and it's not really a joke, I said of all the technology the Chinese steal from us, it'd be nice if they would utilize our pollution control technology. Because they don't, we use bag houses and scrubbers, and coal-fired power plants are phenomenal here in the US. They're not in other places around the world. And that's unfortunate. And this ESG energy discrimination movement is probably one of the biggest threats that we're seeing. We are the first state, Texas is the first state to pass a bill that says if you're gonna boycott fossil fuels, then you can't do business with the state of Texas. Doesn't mean that you can't go to a bank and do bank as an individual with that particular bank, but this guy named James Lofton showed up and testified. And for those of you that follow the legislative process, when you have a bill that you're for, you typically have it choreographed. You know who's gonna show up and support your bills. Who's, and you probably know who's gonna testify against. Well, out of the blue, I see that I hear the chair of the Committee of State Affairs in the Texas House. Uh, I've got James Lofton from Houston here to testify and support of Senate Bill 3 on behalf of himself. And my heart sinks and I start to get nervous and I'm watching online, I start texting people on our team, who is this guy, where'd he come from, he's gonna kill our bill. Because I have seen people, in my experience, testify in support of bills and do such a bad job because they're not <laughs> persuasive that they kill the bill. And I'm thinking James Lofton is gonna kill our number one priority of getting this energy discrimination bill passed. And James Lofton gets up there and he says, I'm from Houston, I, I work in the oil and gas industry, I have a service company, I have 53 employees, and I was actually here to testify today in support of some Second Amendment bills. But I'm sitting here in committee and I hear the testimony and the layout of this bill and then I read the bill. And he goes, and I just wanna share an experience that I had with you, and he banked at Chase Bank. And Chase Bank, for 20 years, he banked with him, had good payment records, had a $500,000 line of credit for his oil and gas services business. 53 employees, 53 families that he's responsible for. And because he's in the oil and gas business, Chase Bank cut his line of credit to zero. And James Lofton's worried about losing his business and worried about the 53 families that he's responsible for. 
and to prove it's just because he's in the oil and gas business, he goes to Frost Bank in Texas, and Frost Bank not only extends him a line of credit, but they double it because he's got a good profitable business and he's made his payments over the years. And so James Lofton really sealed the deal for us passing this piece of legislation that the governor signed a few months ago. And in that time frame, Chase Bank has come back and said, because of the policies that are being passed in Texas, we can now no longer play and, and we're, we're gonna lose an opportunity to invest $3.6 billion in municipal debt. And I say, well, quit taking an anti-Texas position, quit being anti-American, be consistent with your policies and then you can play in our municipal bond market, which is $400 billion in debt and growing. $300 billion in our state pension funds. We've seen other state treasurers follow our model and implement rules that they're gonna start divesting of banks that are discriminating against the responsible production of oil and gas in their states. And I think that's good because we, again, we produce it more responsibly than anywhere else in the, in the world. We shouldn't be taking these positions against American energy. We should be promoting American energy. And I did an interview yesterday with someone that we export our natural gas around the world to places like Argentina, India, Poland, and with that, we export our clean air around the world. And those are the policies that we do need to be exporting around the world. So I probably completely digressed on some point that I was trying to make about punishment and persuasion, but I have ADD and I tend to do that. <laughs> but uh, hopefully I shared some good information with you uh, on this. And, and again, we should be proud American, proud Americans, especially uh, yesterday on Veterans Day, but we should be seeing the praises of our policies and educating people and trying to be persuasive with our policies and knowledge, and hopefully that will impact policymakers that are traveling to COP26 to be pro-American and exporting uh, our energy and our leadership and our policies around the world for the benefit of the people that live on Earth, mankind. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you both for being here. Would you give our panelists a hand, please? Thank you. Thank you so much. And lunch is ready. The restrooms, again, are across the road, and I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, across the lobby, but it feels like across the road. Um, at the lunch is served outside, and our panelists will be around for a little while if you'd like to ask them the questions that I couldn't get to. Thank you all.